Well, hello there. Uh, welcome to uh, March the 25th, <laughs> 2020 edition of Disciple You. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at Romans 3, 21 through 4, 3, as you can see on the screen. Um, as you can also tell, I am uh, at my house, not at the at the church building. Uh, we have a, a room in our house. Uh, our basement has kind of got a uh, baseball decor, so that's that's where I'm hanging out this evening uh, to share with you. Uh, so kind of give you a, a glimpse of life uh, life in my house. Uh, I am recording this, so you may have some hear some uh, some of my co-workers, if you will. Uh, the boys are upstairs, so they may be hooping and hollering at any time, as well as a dog kind of doing his own thing. So, but tonight we are going to be looking at uh, Romans once again, and you know this is a our study is in conjunction with what we're doing in our morning Bible study on Sunday morning, um, or what we were doing on our campus, uh, but during this time we're now off campus, so um, we'll be doing this uh, focus uh, during that time. So uh, without any further ado, we're going to dive in. Uh, because this is pre-recorded, um, just so you know, uh, I will be in the chat as well. So it'll be, you'll see me uh, recorded message, but then I'll be live in the chat answering questions as well as maybe throwing some questions out. Hopefully I don't heckle myself too much with uh, some of my responses. So, um, But um, let me uh, kind of begin uh, this time with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for time in your word. I, I pray that it's a uh, time to strengthen uh, your saints, um, whether they be from Echota or wherever they are, uh, listening to this live or sometime later. I pray that you use this time to strengthen us for your work and remind us of how greatly blessed we are in you. Lord, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we begin this lesson, um, you know, and some of you that, again, uh, may be working through this material uh, with, uh, with at our church or with other churches is from the Explore the Bible curriculum and their progression through the book of Romans. You know, I couldn't help but be thinking about uh, just some uh, sometimes when we feel deficient. You know, I think they talk in the book about uh, opportunities, or I shouldn't say opportunities, uh, times when, um, you know, maybe you felt a deficient whether you had a debit card declined or came up short in cash or whatever you know i think i, I shared not too long ago uh, we had our identity stolen and someone charged up quite a bit of money on uh, um, a false account they created on our behalf and bought all kinds of jewelry and you know as we're kind of working through that and trying to uh, get to a point of resolution with that you know if it ever comes to the point where they say okay you're responsible for that you have to pay for that even though we didn't do it, we would definitely be deficient in that because we don't have the means to, to pay for uh, that type of uh, uh, expense within our own budget. So, you know, as we think about what it means to be deficient, you know, as we look spiritually, all of us are deficient. None of us can ever measure up. You know, you know, we, so we think about that example of being able to have the means to, uh, to be financially sufficient. Um, you know, when we think about our spirituality, we will always be spiritually deficient uh, because of our fallenness, because of our sin. You know, as we've looked in Romans so far, um, we've seen uh, Paul progress through talking about how none are righteous. Uh, he started with the Gentiles or, or all of humanity talking about how, you know, even from a nature perspective, we are without excuse. You know, all of us are, are guilty. And then as we saw last week, he spent some time talking about Jews. Uh, and he said, you know, they are are hiding behind their self righteousness when in all reality, uh, their their heart is uncircumcised. Then uh, their heart is far from the Lord. Uh, we're all sinners, but God is going to provide a way, as we see in the scriptures uh, today. Uh, and there'll be a heavy emphasis as we work through this passage uh, this evening on the word faith. Uh, we're going to be looking at thirteen verses, and in those thirteen verses, we'll see the word faith eight times. So it's fake. Uh, take special notice of that as we work through our passage today. So again, I direct your attention to Romans uh, chapter 3. Um, we'll kind of get our slides going in that direction. All right, Romans chapter 3, we'll start in verse 21. Uh, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift uh, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So as we see this passage, uh, we'll first see right out of the gate uh, that righteousness is revealed apart from the law. 
a salvation outside of the law. Um, so as we think about that, you know, you know, salvation outside of the law, meaning that the law cannot grant salvation. Uh, you know, as we think about it, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, the law has a purpose. The law makes us aware of who God is and how we can't measure up. You know, the law enters in the scene with Moses and the Ten Commandments and, and such. You, you guys are familiar with that, I pray. Uh, but, you know, that's that's uh, where we see that, you know, what God requires of humanity. And then we find that each and every one of us comes up short. Uh, you know, and as we continue to look at that passage, we see that apart from the law, there is no righteousness. Or excuse me, apart from the law, righteousness is revealed. And that truthfulness is confirmed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets point to the fact that salvation is going to be uh, through faith and faith alone. Uh, so again, looking back at our our PowerPoint here, uh, salvation or righteousness, I should say righteousness, not just righteous uh, comes to all who believe, but righteousness comes to all who believe uh, from this passage. There's no distinction. Um, it's offer for of hope for available to all people. You know, we can't help but be reminded of those passages of Scripture that Romans uh, 10, 13 says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, it doesn't say this person, that person, or this, this type of person, but everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And of course, there's John 3, 16 uh, that reminds us of, um, you know, that, that truth um, for the fact that, uh, for God so loved the world, so whoever believes in him, uh, or excuse me, get it all straight here. <laughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, uh, but have everlasting life. Uh, so as we reflect on those those truths, we see that um, this faith comes to all people. Uh, those, so it's not a righteousness that's anchored in the law, but a righteousness that comes through uh, grace, that comes through faith and believing in who Jesus Jesus Christ is. So the next thing we see that all have sinned and need salvation. Uh, we see that in Romans 3.23. That's a passage I believe that many of us are, are familiar with as we think about uh, the gospel as according to the Romans road, you know, working through that. And Paul illustrates this truth a little bit earlier in Romans chapter 3. Uh, and he says this, uh, 3 starting in verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have all already charged that all uh, we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin as it is written none is righteous none not not one no one understands no one seeks for God all have turned aside together they have become worthless no one does good not even one uh, this is visual image here their throat is an open grave and they use their tongues to deceive the venom of asps is under their lips their mouth is full of curses and bitterness their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and mercy, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, so the reality of it is, everyone, all of us, none of us are righteous. Whether we're talking Jew or whether we're talking Gentile, none of us are righteous. And then when we compare ourselves to God, and this is for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, God is perfect. None of us is perfect. And we fall short of that standard. And because of that, as we know from Scripture, again, thinking about the Romans road, if we look on over and we'll carry it, uh, cover it more in our later in our studies, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death. And that's something that awaits every single one of us. So, so far in this first little section, we see that righteousness is revealed apart from the law. Salvation is, comes outside of the law. Uh, the law has a purpose, and that's to open our eyes to our need for, for something else, our need for God. Righteousness comes to all who believe. Righteousness is anchored in faith, and all have sinned and need this salvation. Well, there's hope. There's hope for the sinfully condemned. I don't know if that's good grammar or not, but I think it, it carries a, a powerful message You know that we're all condemned because of our sinfulness. There is free justification. There's free uh, salvation for those um, that, that believe in Christ. Uh, so we're justified by His grace as a gift, as it says there in Romans 3, 24. Um, so again, uh, being mindful of the fact that you know there's nothing that we do on our own that is completely a work of God. So just think about this just for a moment, from the progression of thinking of the work of God. 
you know, God inspires the Word. He's the one that gives the truth. As we think about Scripture, it's God-breathed. It's inspired. So God inspires the Word, okay? And then He illuminates the Word, or He opens the eyes of, of individuals to understand His Word. And then He convicts them of the truthfulness of His Word. Um, so they, they see what His Word is. Their eyes are open to, to understand it. And then they realize, okay, does this have impact on my life? Yes, okay, how do I need to change my life in regard to that? So he inspires the word, he illuminates the word, he convicts us of the truthfulness of the word, and then if we believe in it, he brings us salvation. And it's in that salvation, that moment that we cry out in faith, that we cry out in belief, that he justifies us, makes us right with him. Again, as we continue to think through that progression of those fancy theological words, we go from justification then into sanctification where he, he transforms us and, and makes us more like his son Christ. And eventually we reach that place of uh, glorification where we're in the presence of Christ, where we're, when we're made perfect, when all is restored. And the beauty of this as we think about this justification and this complete work is it, it's a gift. A gift of grace. Uh, we are justified by His grace as a gift. You know, grace is what? Unmerited favor. God gives us something we don't deserve. We deserve eternal condemnation. We deserve hell because of our failure to, com to comply with the law, our failure to, to measure up to God's standard. But God offers us a free gift. You know, again, taking our, our, our walk back to to Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're justified by that same gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, that Jesus accomplished our redemption. Jesus accomplished our justification. Uh, you know, he redeems us. He buys us back from our, uh, uh, from our sinfulness. He buys us back from that uh, that state of condemnation through his his death. And that's what we've been walking through on Sunday morning as we've been talking about uh, the seven words of Jesus from the cross as we wrap up that series uh, this Sunday morning. I hope you'll you'll join us there either live or, or watch that feed at, at another time. So that's the first section as we work through this passage, uh, looking at Romans 3, 21 through, through 24. Now the next section, as we'll see, is in Jesus, or it's been entitled in Jesus in our book, and I think that's a, a good way to look at it, uh, looking at uh, Romans 3, 25 through 26. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the first things first, as we think about uh, this section of, of Scripture there in Romans 3, 25 and 26, we see that God gave His Son to be our atonement. And this atoning gift applies to our lives uh, through faith. Uh, you know, as we are reminded of what Christ has done on our behalf, He is our atonement. He is that blood sacrifice. Uh, you know, as we see in Scripture, there can be no uh, forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Uh, you know, just as the sacrificial system was set up for, for Jews, and we understand that Paul is connecting with this original audience, which would have been Jews, as we've uh, seen uh, last week as he addresses them. Okay, who, who among you says you're a good Jew and all these things? But uh, he points to the fact that Jesus comes and makes an atonement. He becomes that blood sacrifice for us, uh, for all of humanity. And it's an atoning gift that applies to our lives through faith. Again, pointing to the fact that God initiates our salvation. He's the one that provides a way for us to, to know Him. He's the one that uh, offers us uh, hope through the work of Christ. So again, uh, being mindful of the fact that it's not about what we do, it's not about what we accomplish, but what He gives us. He gives us this gift uh, for our benefit. You know, I can't help but be reminded of uh, Hebrews 7, 27, as we think about the sacrifice that, that Christ uh accomplishes on our behalf. It says this uh, about uh, his the, the completeness, the sufficiency of his sacrifice. In Hebrews 7, 20, it says, says, He has no need, talking about Christ, He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of his, uh, the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. 
You know, Jesus completed the sacrifice. He offered a sacrifice once and for all for sins in the past, present, and the future, and then for all people. And he's not like other high priests that could only do it, that had to do it once a year. First off, they had to offer a sacrifice for their own sin, as we see in that passage, but then for the other people. No, Jesus takes care of it all. He takes care of a sacrifice, or does uh, commits this sacrifice, or voluntarily gives up his life as a, as a sacrifice for all people, for all times, uh, in all places. Uh, this universal sacrifice uh, over time and over, over all people. Uh, so as we think about what Christ has accomplished on, on our behalf, uh, this uh, can apply to our life through faith. You know, as this will be the focus of this passage as we're seeing. And God declares who is righteousness, or who is righteous, again, kind of getting tongue-tied on that word, that God declares who is righteous through faith in Jesus. As we see that uh, again back in verse uh, 26, where it says, It is was to show his righteousness at the present time. So when the time was right, uh, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So he's the one that declares who's righteous. Uh, it's not about um, you know us getting to the point where we've done enough good things for us to declare our righteousness, but what Christ has done on our behalf, uh, knowing that that's where uh, our righteousness is anchored in. Now, our works won't secure it. Our belief in Christ is the only thing that res uh, uh, results in our righteousness, uh, that results in our, our salvation. So as we continue to, to look at uh, this passage, we see that we get to the third section. For all people, uh, there in Romans 3, 27 through 31. What then, or excuse me, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law uh, by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So again, thinking of what we see here in this passage in Romans 3, 27-31, one of the first things we see is that the law of grace versus uh, works of the law. You know, right out of the gate, you know, Paul has this list of uh, rhetorical questions uh, for the, his audience, uh, for those that are reading his letter to the Romans church, the Roman church. And he says this, uh, what about our boasting? What kind of law? What By law of works. And he goes on and says, is God for Jews? Uh, is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? So, throwing these questions out to his readers to help them to really to provoke their heart and think about, you know, what's going on here, um, you know, and in contrast to the law of grace versus the law of works. You know, the law of grace that's where salvation is, you know, or, or the law of faith that's where salvation is. The reality of it is uh, being that you know, apart from faith, apart from grace. Uh, we can't have salvation. Now, if we try to follow the works of the law, if we try to complete that or, or complete, be completely obedient to that, we will fall short over and over and over again. Uh, you guys know as well as I do, you know, the, the trap of self-righteousness. You know, we can try our best to be obedient, but we will fall. We're sinful people. And I'm so thankful that it's not left up to my own efforts. It's not left up to me uh, trying to accomplish X, Y, Z to, to earn my status with God. Because I would be lost. I would be, I would be condemned for all eternity. And that's what the beautiful thing is when we think about uh, the Christian faith. It is not based on what we do. It's based on what God's done on our behalf. You know, in a roundtable discussion among other uh, religions, I, if I'm not mistaken, C.S. Lewis made these comments. You know, you're there and there's this, um, uh, this discussion among adherents of other religions, and they're talking about the uniqueness of their faith and there were so many things that were common more so but the one thing that stood out about christianity was the fact that it was all about grace you know we're not trying to earn our position or we're not trying to make ourselves better it's the fact is we are counting on god to do a work in us and it's uh, through faith that we find our our salvation is through our faith in him and what christ has done on our behalf that we are seen as righteous so it's a law of faith or a law of grace as we see uh, in this passage. Um, and so, you know, and, and more particular is the wording in that passage is law of faith. So then as we continue to look at this section on all for, for all people, 
you know, it's through faith that God justifies all people. Uh, again, uh, noting, as we saw a little bit earlier in the passage, there's no distinction. Uh, verses 29 through through 31 uh, make it clear. It says, you know, it's not just the God of the Jews, not just God of the Gentiles, not just the God of the Baptists, not just, God. well, I didn't say all that, but we could take it to that level. Um, you know, realizing that, you know, God doesn't make the same stipulations that, that we do. Uh, where we think, uh, or I think maybe maybe we don't, but in our minds we kind of get a, a, a tunnel vision, and we think, okay, God, that person may be beyond that. Or, no, there's not. There's no distinction. All people are welcome uh, through faith. God justifies all people. Uh, and so the question that comes out of this too, as we look at this passage, uh, it says there, um, you know, uh, in verse thirty-one, do we then overthrow? the law by this faith by no means on the contrary we uphold the law so does faith abolish the law you know there's many out there that say okay we're in the new testament forget the old testament um you know and i understand what you're trying to say there maybe not as severe as that that statement as i said but the reality of it is the new testament is a fulfillment of the old testament you know the work of christ is a fulfillment of what the law has has called us to do uh, or what it, it does. Uh, so, and it's important for we understand that the faith that faith fulfills the law's purpose. The law is a tool of conviction. The law is the tutor that leads us to salvation, or leads us to that point of salvation or time to trust in Christ. Uh, Galatians three twenty four says this. So then, the law was our guardian, or, or some translations say tutor, until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. So the law prepped our heart, made us ready, helped us to understand. We can't do it. We can't accomplish it. We can't measure up. We need help. And then God shows us, okay, this is what I'm going to do to help you. I send my son. I've sent my son to be perfect, to show you how to live life. And then I know you can't live up to that example. So what I'm going to do is he's going to die in your place, be your substitute. And it's through his redemptive work, I'm going to buy you back from destruction and redeem us. And then in that, you do such a transforming work in your heart that you will then be able to be obedient to the law. You will be obedient to, and because Christ's righteousness will be working in you and you'll be, be transformed to match up with that. It's so beautiful that we are not left to our own. The fact of the matter is God does the work for us. We just simply have to believe in him and trust him. And when we do, he does such a transforming work in our heart. And, you know, it's, it's so powerful as we look at this passage that then Paul gives us a case study. He says, okay, let me tell you about Abraham. So looking in Romans 4, 1 through 3, he says, What then shall we say has gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? You know, remember, I think he's talking to the Jewish audience here, but that's true for us too. Uh, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Uh, so again, looking at a few quick bullet points from this passage in Romans 4, 1-3. through 3, The case study. Uh, Abraham's righteousness was not by obedience to the law. Not because Abraham was a great guy and all these things. I mean, he was that. I mean, God showed him favor. God put a call in his life. But if you read the Scriptures, you know he wasn't perfect. He had moments of doubt. He had moments of rebellion himself which would left him condemned. He realized, though, that his righteousness, his hope, was in his faith in God. Uh, looking at a, a passage, as we, we saw there on the screen, in Genesis 15, which is, uh, is reflected on in Paul's comments there, starting in Genesis 15, verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be great. But Abram said, O God, uh, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus, you know, a servant. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, for your own son will be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven the number the, and number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said, You're off." spring shall be. So he said, you know, your servant's not going to be your heir. I'm going to give you a physical heir. We understand that to be later to be Isaac. But he takes him out there and says, look, look at all the stars. See if you can count them. You can't. 
and you can't count them because the reality of it is the number is so great and so it will be with your offspring. And then verse 6 of Genesis 15 says this, And he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now that same passage, we, we see that reflected there in, in Romans uh, with Paul. So the reality of it is, you know, God places this call on Abraham's life, leave the familiar, leave your people, all these things, and trust me. And Abraham trusts him. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. You know, for us, for us to, to uh, have salvation, to be credited as righteous, to be made right before God, belief is necessary. Faith is necessary. We have to believe that God has done something for us. He has worked our salvation out through the mission of Jesus Christ and what He has done on our behalf by being our atoning sacrifice, making that sacrifice that was once and for all, as we saw earlier uh, in this passage. So real quickly, uh, it's kind of in conclusion, and, and you'll find these are some bullet points that are in our curriculum um, you know, through Explore the Bible. First things first, God gives salvation free to anyone who places their faith in Christ. Um, we know that to be true. There's no distinction. It's offered to all people because what Christ has done on their behalf. The second thing, God declares those who have faith in Christ to be righteous. Our righteousness is not anchored in what we do and how we obey the law and all those different things, but our, our righteousness is anchored in what Christ has done on our behalf. Our, our righteousness is anchored in our belief in what Christ has done on our behalf, faith. Third thing, since all are saved through faith in Christ, boasting is excluded. You know, it's not something that we say, look what I've done, look what I've done, I've done this, and being prideful about it. But the reality is our boasting should be in Christ and what he's accomplished on our behalf. Just as Paul said, you know, I boast in that Christ crucified in him only. And so it should be for us. It's not about making our name known, but making his name known. Um, we're all a bunch of nobodies trying to uh, tell everybody about the somebody, uh, as to echo the words of some saints that have gone ahead of us. Faith is the only path to God. Uh, so, as we think about what it means to be saved, we must remember, first and foremost, that it is a, completely a work of God, but He does such a blessing for us through the work of Christ and grants us the opportunity to be saved if we'll simply believe in Him. We'll simply trust in Him and forsake our, our, our own um, works, forsake our own uh, desires, and repent and trust Him. And in belief, that's where we find salvation. Well, guys, I thank you for joining me tonight. I know um, there, hopefully there's some things going on in the feed there. I'll try to kind of <laughs> talk there, I guess, too. This is just weird to even talk about that like that way. Uh, but uh, I'll pray that tonight's uh, Bible study was a blessing uh, to you. Uh, have a great week. Take care.